So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure inviting Professor Manish Verma uh, for this talk today. Uh, Professor Manish Verma has been a great friend of mine. Uh, he comes from University, McGill University, uh, where he is an associate professor in the area of operations management at the Big Group School of uh, Business. Uh, uh, Professor Verma comes with an MBA in Finance and a PhD in Operations Management Management Sciences from the Dissolvers Faculty uh, of Management at McGill University. Uh, his research interests are mainly in multimodal transportation of dangerous goods and I think the talk that he's going to present today is going to uh, deal with uh, transportation of these hazardous material. Uh, <coughs> and risk assessment Probably that is also going to feature in today. Uh, network design and planning issues in transportation, humanitarian logistics, green supply chain management, and disruption and resilience in transportation. Most of the things we will see, they will figure in some uh, in one way or the other in his talk today. Uh, his current research engagements focus on safety and security issues in freight transportation and on humanitarian logistics and are funded by Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council and Social Sciences and Humanity, Humanities Research Council grants. So these are the two major, major granting agencies in, in Canada, in North America. His works have been published in leading international journals like uh, in transportation and in operations research. Uh, so with that background, I uh, invite Professor Varman to talk about his research. Thank you, Sachin. Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the talk. Uh, it is a talk entitled An Infrastructure Investment Methodology to Risk Mitigation from Rail Hazard Shipment. It is a joint work with my former PhD student who is a faculty member at UIC. So, <clears throat> very quickly, I'll uh, talk about hazmat and I'll try to introduce you to the hazmat transportation domain with a focus in North America. Uh, talk mostly about rail hazmat uh, shipments and uh, which in turn will motivate the need for this research. Uh, then I will outline the proposed uh, infrastructure investment methodology, uh, talk about the solution and discuss the output that we have at the moment uh, <coughs> before, before, before concluding. So hazardous materials like this crude oil, propane, gasoline, so this is integral to our the lifestyle and you cannot really get away from this and typically the points of consumption and points of consumption the points of production and consumption are far away so you have to move shipments you have to move shipments it turns out that in North America most of the majority of the non-bulk has had is moved on the highway network or on the railroad network if it is bulk then it is pipeline obviously a marine would be the mode of choice uh, focusing just on rail hazmat shipments, so this is a predominant mode in North America. To put things into perspective, uh, approximately 5% of the freight in the US and 12% in Canada is hazmat. And it is on the rise, so it is, it is sort of increasing, and in part because of the uh, use of intramodal uh, combinations to move hazmat. And also the more recent phenomenon in the past eight, eight, 10 years, which is the need to sort of capture the, of this crude oil from shale formation and oil sands in the lack of this landlocked uh, portion of the continent and move them to the refineries along the coast. And uh, this is primarily happening because of insufficient pipeline infrastructure. And that is not really going to change in the next, next eight, 10 years because of the lead time involved in building pipeline plus the long-term commitment required from refineries and uh, transporters. So that's the backdrop. Uh, here is how Canada looks. Uh, it is a pretty uh, big, big country. Uh, however, most of the production, production is happening here in the landlocked provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan. However, most of the refineries are on the east coast here. And of course, the pipeline is really at capacity. Uh, and it is landlocked, so you don't have the marine transportation options. So what do you do? If the railroad is the only way how you can move these things. You cannot really move it on trucks, if you think about it. Because these refineries, they have to operate 24 seven. So you cannot have like 5,000 trucks going every day from west to east. So that's, that's not really a viable option. 
fortunately, the railroad is one of the safest modes for uh, moving hazmat shipments. But the possibility of spectacular events, which is defined as low probability, high consequence events, it does exist. And the most uh, tragic and the recent one is very close to where I come from. And uh, Dr. Jaswal visits, visit, Professor Jaswal visits the uh, province of Quebec every year. So uh, this is a lack of gigantic. So what happened some five and a half years ago is that a crude oil train carried uh, with 73 tank cars with derailed. A number of these tank cars ruptured and, uh, and it exploded, wiping out an entire township. And it is a big deal out there. So it called into question what kind of policies are being followed and what can we, what, what are the additional things that could be done to further bring down the risk. Uh, fortunately, hazmat area has been an active area of research for the past 40 years. People have been working in this area, uh, including some of the things which we have done. Of course, I haven't been working in this area for I'm only 32, so I cannot be working for 40 years. No, I'm 47. <laughs> but but anyway, so I think. But but we have been working in this area for, for almost almost 15 years. Uh, so so just to just to set up the motivation and to let you see the gap. Uh, I'm very uh, provide you with a very high level overview of the recent relevant research sort of engagement in this area. So primarily it is in the risk assessment of rail hazard shipments. And all of you have worked with distribution. So, so the most popular approach used to be traditional risk, which is an expected consequence approach. I take the probability of an event and multiply that by the consequence of it was outcome. This approach is risk neutral. If you think about this, so it's expected value, it's a risk neutral approach. It also has some limitations. Limitations is that it, uh, of course, it's risk neutral, but it is really very data heavy. So, so you require information on probabilities and consequences, which typically may not be available for each and every link in the network. So, two parallel schools emerged here. One said that I have to focus. Only on the incident probabilities. So I'm just focused on the accident rate, for example. And that is one line of research, but clearly that was only appropriate for hazmat, which has a very localized that's impact area. And then you have on the other side the folks who said that I'm going to be much more conservative and I'm going to focus on what's the worst that can happen. So I'm looking at how many individuals will be exposed if I send a tanker from Ahmedabad to I don't know. So that's the other line of reasons. But uh, both these approaches are sort of risk neutral. This one is a bit more risk averse. So what, the, what, what we did with the, one of my other doctoral students is that we have sort of gone to portfolio management and finance. So I, I did hear someone talk about supply chain finance. And, uh, and in portfolio management, you have some fantastic measures like conditional value of risk, value of risk. So we took those measures and we adapted them for hazmat transportation shipments. And, and we have sort of proposed these methodologies which sort of uh, has a risk averse nature. And then if as a decision maker, you tell me what is your attitude towards risk, I can tell you what is the route you should take. So that is a big uh, so that, that's just a recent, recent, recent work uh, which uh, appeared in the last two years. So that's one line of research, risk assessment. The second line of research is risk management. How do you mitigate or manage risk from rail hazmat shipment? And I'm just focusing on rail hazmat shipments. So needless to say, highway area is, uh, I think, richer uh, because of the nature of the, because of the possibilities. With a denser network, you can do many more things in highways. Risk management, uh, one of the, the, the basically the engineering folks focus just on the design aspect of tank cars or the tracks, uh, which is a lot of interest to us. Um, one other thing is that if you give me a freight train, then what is the best slots to place a hazmat rail car? So we, we can tell you that. We have, we have done some work, the last two pieces we have done there. And of course, you have the actual the routing problem. Routing of hazmat rail cars, so uh, whether 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 it makes sense to take a longer but safer route, 
and then pay some kind of penalty cost if you are missing, basically missing the, the delivery dates. So you have a trade-off function and a Pareto frontier is what you work with. So uh, these things are good. So we have done this uh, things, and people have been working in this area for 15, 20 years. The problem is that uh, they have provided a number of insights, but obviously none of them is going to reduce the possibility of what I just showed you. Low probability, high consequence events. So none of them will do that. And part of that is because of the characteristic of the American with railroad infrastructure, which probably also goes for other part of the world. Uh, if you think about this, the railroad was designed to connect population centers. So you have a train station in downtown Ahmedabad, another one in downtown Mumbai, and it's supposed to move uh, passengers. And it's great for passengers, but not so much for freight, right? especially hazmat. Because what it means is you are sort of sending things from downtown Ahmedabad to downtown Mumbai, and they're putting many more people at risk. So that's the first thing, which is sort of a challenge. And the second one is uh, the North American railroad transportation system is fairly sparse. And the sparse network means you don't have that many routing options. Unlike highways, which is much denser, and which is why uh, it is sort of not really easy to say that. Well, I'm going to close the link between Ahmedabad and Mumbai, or I'm going to impose a toll on them. Because if you do that, what you, what may end up happening is that you have a sparse network. You will have sort of basically you are going to lose connectedness between the network, which doesn't really happen in highways because you have many more options to send things. So these are some challenges. So that we so uh, even in, against the backdrop of the kind of work that has been done in this space, it is not possible to sort of say that I can definitely bring down the risk. So so we were so obviously so the idea that I'm going to present. So I have been advocating for this for the past five years after that accident when I was approached by Transport Canada. <coughs> what I said was that. Railroad companies in North America is private, and unlike in India, it's private there. So the railroad operators or companies do not have an incentive to build these expensive railroad tracks until you really force them to, which they cannot. The government cannot because of the because of the Deregulation Act. But what what, what the government can, can basically do is to provide an incentive for the railroad companies to, to do something different so that possibly it can help in the reduction of risk. So that is the idea that I will present. So what else can be done to mitigate rail hazmat risk? So would building alternative tracks that is going to circumvent population centers, is that going to help? So that's the hypothesis or the postulate that I'm going to explore here. Okay, so that's the second. the idea is so the regulators or the government is going to invest the money and build these tracks and then I'm going to talk about how they will charge the railroad companies. This is what you're I think, getting to here. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. So, okay. so here is the infrastructure investment methodology. So it has three steps. The first step is that if you give me a railroad network, I'm going to do a comprehensive analysis of the railroad network to understand what are the hot spots or the sensitive spots in the network. So it requires a lot of data parts. So you have commodity flow data that you have to disaggregate and come up with what is the actual sort of volume on each part of the network. And then I'm going to sort of compute the risk, obviously. I'm going to talk about how I do the risk calculation. And then based on that, I'm going to ascend all the links in some sort of order. And I think descending order makes sense here. Sort it this one. Basically sort them and then organize them in descending order. And then, depending on the budget I have, I will say that I'm going to take a certain number of links and my budget. And then I will see what are the alternatives I can, alternative routes or links I can build around each of those links. 
each of the links on my shortlist. Okay. And then I'll put, so, and then now, now I have a larger network, if you think about it, I have built additional links. I have an augmented railroad network. I pass on that information to the railroad company and I'll ask the company to solve the problem, the routing problem. And this we see as a bi-level program. So we are saying that the regulator is going to make investment decisions and then pass on the investment decision to the, rather the output of the investment decision to the railroad company which is going to solve the problem, send the output back to the regulator who is then going to evaluate that for risk and the process continues until we are able to find the best solution. Makes sense. So let's go through the three steps. So the first step is very simple. I solve a, a minimum cost flow problem, multi-commodity minimum cost flow problem, uh, where I have n is the index for different types of hazmat that I want to focus on. Ij is the origin destination yard pairing, and p is the path that we are looking at. We have a standard slate of constraint, demand satisfaction, uh, number of trains I need, and then I need this one, now, so this is just me telling me what is the link loading on each of the link and I'm just I'm using an indicator variable and sort of tagging that along with my path based flow variable to do as an extract information about the link volume. Okay, so very simple. So, so, so P and I just, uh, P and M there is a P? Sorry, yeah, so, so um, P refers to the path between so, so so, so I is the, the set of origins, if you will. J is the set of destinations. And IJ is a unique pairing, which is saying what is going from YRI to I, YRJ. It is a multi commodity, so I have commodities which is indexed by small m. And then between each IJ pair, I have, I have different ways to go there. So P is the index for different paths. And then the, the second expression is the fixed cost for different types of trains in the net. So very so it is a standard sort of a variant of a multi-commodity flow problem. Just some minor adaptations required for the set. So I solve this problem. So it will give me a minimum cost for the solution. So what I want to do first of all is just draw your attention to a couple of things which, which, which may not be evident. So in North America there are about 2,000 commodities that are called hazmat. So it is clearly impossible to sort of do the thing for all the 2,000 commodities. So we had to make a decision about how many commodities we are going to focus on. Uh, thankfully, the regulators have organized these commodities into 12 classes, 12. So, so we went ahead and Ali did sort of a standalone analytics piece wherein we looked at the aggregate sort of the crude data set coming from different sources and we organized them and just extracted the information, pertinent information. And based on this analysis, it seems that if I focus on only three commodities, another, only three hazmat classes, classes two, three, and eight, then I'm good enough. Class, class two is the gases, and class three is crude oil, which is the primary driver of this hazmat traffic. And then you have class A, which is corrosives and paints and so on. So these three classes together account for 80% of the hazmat shipment in North America. So if I just focus on this, I'm okay. I don't have to worry about the remaining. Just said that we will 
is the value of small, rather the cardinality of set M is not going to be 2003. Right? So that helps quite a bit. So who is it like for uh, different materials there is a some parameter for the how much result it costs? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so you are so, yeah, so you are sort of getting to a point which is much more technical. So you're saying that I think that what you're saying that within a hazmat class, you may have 50 sort of commodities and each may have different sort of threat level and exposure area. This is what you're getting, different danger level. That's what you're saying. So organizing into the classes reduces the problem size. That is what it is. It reduces the problem size considerably. Considerably. Plus plus the other thing is it doesn't make sense to do it by each of 2,000 commodities. This is what I'm trying to show here that if I'm able to sort of club them, collect them together under basically under these three classes, I'm doing my job, right? So 80% is being accounted by these three classes. So I don't have to worry about that nitty gritty because that's not adding much value to this piece. However, within each class, I look at the hazmat, which is going to cause the maximum damage. So that is the detrimental effect. I look at the worst case within each. If that's what you are hinting at. So we, we have to make some sort of adaptations because uh, there is also sort of a chemical interaction thing going on between these hazmat, which we cannot capture here. I think you have to go to chemistry department and uh, to just understand. The largest scale study was looking at just the top 50 hazmat done by U.S. Department of Transportation. I mean, this is impossible. You, you may not have data. You may have to blow up, I think, laboratories after laboratories trying to understand how this interaction works. It's a challenging thing, that, that part. So we just sort of say that, I look at the worst case. So, on your take, on every route, a single uh, hazmat is show you in a minute, which we have recreated in ArcGIS, and then I figure out how many ways I can go from I to J. And if the number of ways are 5, then, then the value of P will be, is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then I let the model determine which of those 5 paths is going to be used by a specific end, okay. by a specific end. But it doesn't really mean that the other value of M cannot be on the same path. So Sort of limiting them. Okay. So that's just the sort of the background thing to figure out what our focus should be. And uh, right, there are a number of other parameters. So we just look at the sort of the existing literature to figure out some of the values for these inputs. I do want to draw your attention to this particular thing that I will make use of later on. So my measure of risk here is called population exposure. It simply, in very simple terms, it means how many individuals are exposed to a hazmat if it traverses a specific link. And, and we have a, a use, so basically the example I have here is that just to, just to get back to your observation. So this is saying that let's say a specific link has three different trains and each train is carrying a different number of hazmat rail cars on that link. And how do I sort of determine the population exposure? So I'll just look at the train which has the largest volume. And then that allows me to figure out my population exposure. And then of course... Sir, there are, you said that there are 12 classes of uh, hazmat mutation. So there will be... Uh, ranked on the basis of the danger that they cause us. No, like for has, instance, no, it, has, no, it is not ranked per se, so it is organized based on chemical properties. Chemical properties of those commodities. So sir, for instance, if there is a nuclear fuel which is <coughs> transported, so 
maybe its tonnage will not be that much, <coughs> but it can cause a lot more harm if uh, like its exposure would be a lot more. So, <coughs> would the tonnage alone will decide? What alone? Sorry, which one? The tonnage or the weight alone will decide the exposure. <coughs> No, I am going to talk about the functions. The population exposure here is not just the function of the volume, it also looks at the chemical properties. So what I do is, after I get information about the volume here, about whatever has that volume, I go to a special software which is developed for this area, which is ALOHA, which is called Aerial Location of, atmosphere, of Hazardous Atmosphere. And, and I do so basically so basically it allows me to simulate what is going to be the impact. If it is nuclear waste, then what will be the impact of that? If it is crude oil, what is going to be the impact of that? And then based on that, I'm going to take the threshold value or the evacuation distance, if you will. And then I'm going to come to RGIS and I'm going to embed that on top of my railroad network and then extract population exposure. Yes. Sir, what is the second problem here? Yeah, so the regulator will not provide a completely new network. The regulator is only going to add additional links to the existing network. But does he take into does the private network operator take into consideration the population exposure of that link? Because unless he factor in the risk of sending through other links, he will never be finding that one optimal, right? So exactly what I'm trying to answer. Yes, it's what I'm trying to answer. Yes. Okay. I think that you may be able to, to leave the room now, I suppose, <laughs> because the you already, already know the solution. So basically, currently I'm only solving this from the perspective of the railroad company. I haven't sort of talked about regulators yet. And I'm going to tie this with the second level problem. I haven't talked about second level problem yet. So essentially, I'm just saying that, let's say the railroad company solves the problem based on existing practices, which is minimum cost. So they don't care about risk. But, but after I get that solution, how do I evaluate that solution for risk, which is what we are doing here. Okay? So, uh, I have that information, then I could recreate that in RGIS, I go to CPLEX, and then it can just give me the risk solution for that. Okay. So that's the first step. And here is the output for Canada. So once I solve this, so what you see here is, it's a very, it is very faint, but these dots are the yards, and then you have links connecting them. And here is the output for the country. And what we have done is we have these clustered bar charts. You can see, which is telling you the uh, volume of the three classes of interest across the country. And uh, it has close to 800 links and depths under 800 nodes. Uh, is what what we are looking at. However, uh, I'll just focus on one of the provinces, which is here, the province of Ontario, which is what I'm interested in, which is where I come from, and the uh, province here essentially means states. Uh, so, so, so we have all this really detailed information, so if you give me a specific link, I can tell you what is, how many trains are going on that link, and then what is the composition of the train. So I need that information to sort of get an idea about risk. So for this, this particular case, I have information here, so this is telling me that if I want to be conservative, I should do the risk calculation based on 9 plus 25, 34 plasma trade card. This is how we do this. I'm ignoring chemical interaction between plasma because we have no idea what's happening. Or I'm just saying that I look at the hazmat class, whichever is the most detrimental is the one that I'm working with in this case. Okay. So that gives us an idea and, and then what we do is once I identify all these links, so, so here are the different links in the network across the country. And if I rank all those 800 links, here are the top 10 links that we have. 10 riskiest link, and you can see the, it tells you the identity of these links, the state that it resides in, and unsurprisingly, most of them are in the two most populous provinces in the country, Ontario and Quebec. 
It also tells you the hazmat uh, traffic on each lane, the number of rail cars in a specific train, maximum number, and then this information is being used to calculate the population exposure risk, which is the measure of risk for me in this case. Is this okay? Is this setting? Does it make sense? So now, the regulator knows that well, these are the top 10 links or the top riskiest links or the 10 hot spots that I need to concentrate on. Of course, we have information of all the 800. Uh, so depending on the budget, you can see what you want to do. So we go to step number two, where I look at each of each such uh, link and I create alternative routes around it. I should point out that we are ignoring the engineering challenges, the design challenges here, plus the fact that there may be multiple stakeholders like Aboriginal communities that we have to worry about, bodies of water. So I'm just ignoring those things because it's just this, this to let you see uh, how this thing can work. Because there will be some issues in terms of implementation, which I'm not worried about. That's, not, that's obviously not our sort of thing. But what this is saying is that if we have uh, shipments going from I to J and Z, um, and currently everything is going through that red, those black pair of red links, if we somehow create these alternative links, then we are giving some options to that traffic. We can send things to those alternate links. That's the idea behind infrastructure investment. And I do such, so, so we have to explore that option for each link in the network. And mind you, it is not really as straightforward as it looks because you have to have an understanding of the flow of traffic. You have to understand where, where that traffic is sort of destined to. If it is a transshipment yard, then it's okay. But there could be situations where everything is sort of terminating here, for example. Then what do you do? So, so you have to understand the commodity which is where the previous analytics work is very, very useful because he has done really extensive study about the commodity flow and then it's feeding into this piece. Okay, so just to let you see, here is Toronto. So what's happening is, currently, every, so this is the link and the thickness of the edge is telling you the volume. So what it is saying is, this is coming from Western Canada into Toronto. And of course, the different shade is indicative of the population density of different areas around Toronto. And then, and then you have one sort of link which is going to, to the east and the other one is going west. And Sarnia has a refinery. So it makes sense that crude oil is going to go to the refinery. Similarly, uh, is, uh, how approximately, I think a third of the shipment is going towards Montreal because that has a refinery. So that also tells us that Toronto does not really absorb any of the crude oil flow coming into it, which is what I mean by having an understanding of the flow. So, so Toronto in this case is merely serving as a transshipment here, or a transit point. Transit point. And we have uh, uh, validated that empirically, and you can see all the numbers are here, which will add up what is coming in and what is leaving. So here is what we do. We say that, okay, so let's create some alternative links around Toronto. So Toronto, we have five dash links of alternatives that we are creating so that hopefully traffic bypasses Toronto. Uh, here, two, three, four, and five. Oh, sorry. So that's the basic idea behind creating alternatives. Let's go to step three, which is the actual method of this bi-level pro problem that, that, that I'm interested in. So I have an outer level problem here, where, which is the regulator's problem, who is interested in uh, minimizing network risk. And that network risk is a function of three things here. What is the investment being made in creating the alternative links? Uh, what is the link level volume? So, depending on the hazmat on specific, any specific link, I will, I will have an understanding of the population exposure risk. So, so, I have a third element, which is population density around a specific link. 
So needless to say, it does not have a closed form expression. So I don't really know ahead of time. I cannot really write that compactly. Perhaps I think some of my more uh, sort of competent colleagues can. I cannot. So I don't really know how to do that. Well, and then what happens is QM, which is essentially my uh, sort of the link level volume, that is the solution for this part. So, so here is my, again, my minimum multi-commodity minimum cost flow problem of the uh, railroad company, which is the inner level problem. And here, the only thing that we have done is uh, just to discourage the railroad company from using those high-risk links, we have modified the cost matrix. So I'm imposing higher cost on the specific, something like you were mentioning in your presentation about how you discourage direct Think spoke to spoke, some, something on those lines. And then I have a standard set of things. So I just want to draw your attention. So uh, it has a lower level has only integer variables. Uh, upper level has binary variable, but it does not have a closed form solution. So we don't really have a very, any intelligent solution to, I know all of you are really specializing in this area. So, you might expect really good is a solution. I don't have one, but I'm going to solve it nevertheless. I solve it using some crude heuristic. So I'm focusing on only the top 10 things. And I would say that uh, I have uh, enough budget to build two links. So I have 10 links. I have budget to build two links. So if I solve 10 choose to 45 combinations, 45 possible combinations are there for the lower level problem. And if I solve all of them, I evaluate each of the 45 for risk. Whichever results in the lowest risk is the best solution for the resource of two. Does that make sense? And then I'm going to sort of continue to it. So if you tell me that I have more money, so, so I solve it for two, I freeze the solution for two, and then I do the incremental analysis. I don't go back and solve it from scratch, but I just freeze that and then solve it uh, for the, every sort of incremental budget that you uh, provide. And we stop if no risk reduction is possible. So That's does that mean that you start with 10C1 and then go to 10C2 and then 10C3? No, 10C1 we didn't. 10C2 was the most. So you start with 10C2 and then uh, look for 10C3 without actually solving for entire 10 c choose uh, three. Uh, that's right. I don't do this. Uh, yes, I don't do basically uh, 10 C3 because because of the larger number. number. So you I say that you want to get there. Uh, that's right. So so this, I say that I've solved for 10 this this 10 C2. I know what's the optimum solution. So I freeze that and I just basically search for the third okay. third one. So that essentially involves solving I think eight choose one. So eight. Yeah. yeah. So that's the way how you've done this. So if I solve that, so obviously I have 40, uh, 45 solutions. Here is the existing setting, status quo. And it turns out if I build these two links, one on the outskirts of Toronto and the other one on the outskirts of Montreal, so that in turn is going to result in, in maximum reduction across the network and also maximum risk reduction uh, amongst the top 10 links. And this is going to come at a really, uh, so half a million dollar more than whatever is the existing cost. It's not that much more. Because remember, we are ignoring the cost to build these links. So that's being done by the regulator. Right? So the railroad company does not have to pay anything in this case. So that's a different kind of problem, which may be much more interesting to think about. So what should be the, what should be the penalty or the toll, toll that you want to impose? So that's more an interesting problem. So this half a million dollars is the additional cost that these private companies will incur if they have to read out their flows to the partner. That's right. Which may not be the cheaper option. Which definitely is not the cheapest option, but but yeah, yeah. But that really might and although it is it is going to bring it down quite a bit. So I think you have to think about this a little bit more managerially. So railroad companies do have to carry insurance, right? So they have to move things so I think uh, I think I I think here also freight companies have to carry insurance. And every time a truck or a rail car meets with an accident, the insurance rate is going to go up. So it's in their interest to bring it down as much as possible. Uh, 
and the, and the regulators are interested in between sort of basically societal sort of societal benefit or well-being. So I think it's in their interest. So increasing this, uh, this getting increased by half a million doesn't take the insurance costs into account. No, we have not. So it's purely the rerouting cost, if you will, the routing cost. So this increase in routing cost. Uh, that is a bit more sort of, uh, you can even think about a much more composite sort of cost function, which would have a variable routing cost, fixed train cost, and insurance. I guess how it will impact the insurance premium. Maybe taking the insurance costs into account, this might be a favorable solution even in terms of costs, right? Yes, well. yes, that's a good point, yeah. absolutely. That's a good Sir, point. I'm just wondering how addition of a link can lead to increase in routing costs. For, for you are changing the cost matrix and then calculating the cost. So addition of a link will result in, so, so remember I said that we did uh, sort of modify the cost matrix. So the, how was that link? Just manually, I just, just said that, so this, I have this list of links, so let's say top 10 links. And then I said that, what is the, so what is the way I can dis, dis, dissuade the railroad companies from using those risky links? So, because, because railroad companies are solving minimum cost for problems, if I ensure that the cost of using a specific link is higher than an alternate link, so your companies will not use that. That is kind of a trend, you decrease it, you no, increase the cost by a certain amount, then you solve the problem, then you get the We have a really excellent data set, a realistic data set that we work with, so we, we know all those numbers, right, so based on so I had I had sort of shown you a slide where we have information about transport violence also. If I know the length of the link, so I said it's 50 cents a transport mile. Right, somewhere, somewhere in here. So, so I know the length of the link, I know how much it would cost. I'm the railroad company because I have to make the decision. Well, I'm not paying him. So, as a railroad company, I'm not paying anything for building the links. However, if an alternate link has become available, and if the current link, I'm going to be penalized for using the current link, which is what it means penalty, right? You are increasing the travel costs. So, if I'm being penalized for using that link, why would I use that? I'm going to use an alternate link. How is the penalty can be calculated? You have been penalized for using how exactly is that number is that? Just change the cost coefficient. So that is trident, right? You see, so you can actually increase the toll on a very popular road. That is by trident error. You can say trident error, but because I know the length of the alternate, so basically an existing link is let's say 100 miles long. So 100 miles into 50 cents, so that's dollars then and then and then alternate link is going to be let's say 150 that's 150 dollars however the cost of using the current link i'm just going to look at 150 and make it 151 and then i know that the railroad company will not use this does it make sense so i think you can call it trial and error but because i have rgis things i can just take exact measurement current network, here is the sort of distribution of 
uh, distribution of high consequence events with the respective probabilities. If I plot the same, not the same thing, but, but if I have an augmented network with these two the additional links, then you can see that the probability of really high consequence events it has gone down quite a bit. So there's clustering here, and I don't have that many episodes happening here, probably, so which also makes sense. So we have sort of managed to so mitigate uh, the possibility of really high consequence events happening because of the insertion of these links. Uh, so let you see the visual impact. So that's the existing situation here. I think I showed you this. And if I open this new link, here is how the traffic is going to start flowing. So there will be splitting. And pretty much everything goes away from Toronto. Moves away from them. So actually in this problem, like you have an existing link which is being used by the private operator. And you are suggesting like alternate links to it, right? And you are saying like which one would he choose based on his cost metrics, right? Which one the railroad company will he choose? Choose based on his cost metrics, right? But anyways, like you are enlisting the uh, private operator by uh, increasing the cost metrics such that the existing link, which is dangerous, will not be chosen by him, right? And even anyways, go for an alternative link. Okay. And uh, the cost of that link will be proportional to the length of the link. So anyways, like the, the least cost length is what is going to be preferred by the operator, right? You don't need to... So anyways, when you have multiple alternative links... But I have an alternative for each of the 800 links in the network, exactly. so I need to know where I am. So, absolutely, so that's the objective here. But, but as, the, as the investor or as the regulator, I need that. And I have a finite budget, I need to know where I should spend that money. Right, so, so I... So that's the underlying idea, absolutely. So that is the underlying idea. But but I still need to decide that this, 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 I have a half a million dollar budget, let's say. And I have to decide that, okay, half a million dollar budget is enough to build five things. Where should I build those things in the net? So that answer your question. So, so I know that it's going to go on the shortest path, on the least risky path. <coughs> But where should I be sort of inserting those findings into the network? Does that address you? So the cost of each of the links is different, right? In your new matrix, which you have assigned. So, so the cost of the link is not really that the cost important. Of using the path. The link. Because it's a path-based formulation, right? So so the cost of the link is not that important. The cost of the link is only important because of the way we are approaching this problem. I'm not building a complete path, and you can think about that why. But I cannot really build a path for each OT pair because they are going to be using set of links which are common for a number of paths. Um, so, so link-based argument, which is why we have to sort of rely on that. Uh, but cost of the link obviously is going, well, it may not be, there could be situations wherein two links of equal length may have the same travel cost. If I have two links which are 100 mile long, then the travel cost, I think, will be the same cost. However, because they are part of different paths, so that may be different. And again, go back to the argument I said about sparsity in the network. So it's not highway, so you may have like four ways to get there. And it's highly unlikely that four paths will have exactly the same cost for a given IJ pair. <coughs> may, but I think it's highly unlikely. And if that happened, we have gone in and changed it. Because, we, because you do want it to be distinct. Only that is going to be interesting. So this is just looking at the volume. We have similar information about the risk, and you can see how it's uh, spreading if you are uh, presenting an augmented network. I'm just focusing on Toronto, but we have similar things for Montreal and other parts of the country. I've just looked at the top 10 links. You can do this for other, uh, I think, 50, 60. Uh, my suspicion is that Indian railroad network is denser. It's probably more interesting to do this kind of work here. We should we can, we can look at that. Analysis may be much more, I guess, interesting. So, so here is the incremental analysis. So, so I've solved this thing until here. And if you tell me that, well, I have budget for one additional link, 
then I can tell. So it's incremental analysis. So I'm not really solving 10 choose 3 because that's just very tedious. So I'm saying that I already have the solution, optimum solution for 2, budget of 2. So I'll freeze it and then I just do the evaluation for 8 possible ways. So that's it. And then I continue doing that, but it turns out that beyond 7, and, well, I should say beyond a budget of 4, it doesn't really make sense to invest any more money. Because if it stagnates first and starts deteriorating. And that's because the sort of additional links that we are building in the whole scheme of things, it may be shorter, but it is becoming riskier. In the whole scheme of things, I, it's difficult to isolate a specific instance and sort of cite it, but in the overall scheme of things. So that is pretty much the presentation. Uh, uh, future research is quite is interesting here because uh, it, it does sort of set the case to not really play around with the transport matrix, but look at that as a sort of a piece of decision variable, which is endogenous to the model, sort of to decide based on the link and type of hazmat, what should be the value. And of course, there is a need for, well, we can talk about risk equity here, which is quite important in hazmat context, which we have looked at different under different settings. And solution methods, more, more sophisticated solution methods, and uh, most of you have been working in this bi-level setting, so I'm sure uh, you guys know quite a bit about this. So, so I thank you for your attention and I welcome uh, suggestions and feedback how we can improve this. Peace. So, thank you. So, following on the question that uh, Deepthi had, Deepthi is uh, sitting at the back. Hi. Uh, so, her question was, uh, let's say at the upper level we have already identified which are the five or which are the three, which are the three links to open, alternate links to open. Then we go to the lower level problem and the lower level problem we are solving a multi-commodity network problem. And because we are saying that we are penalizing the existing links which are actually risky and we want to incentivize the use of the alternate links, so of course all the alternate links will be used. Right? That was my question. So the question is, what are we solving at the lower level problem? Is that your question? Yeah, because you, it's right. obvious that all those links will be used. For a given length, when you have multiple right. propagations, right. it is right. right. choosing the one which has a minimum length, which right. has a minimum cost. Right. But I think, I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, what is not obvious in the, the lower level problem is which commodity will get routed over which link. So you have now, you have probably provided an alternate design for the network and how the multi -com multiple commodities will be routed, you don't know that. And unless you know that, you don't know the solution from the lower level problem. So it's, it's a different design of the network, and now you still have to flow multiple commodities, and how will the commodities, which commodity will go on which link, that is something probably you don't know about. Is that, is that, is that, am I right? Right, so, absolutely, so, just because, so I think that the way you think about this is so, you are familiar with multi-commodity problems, right? Multi-commodity problems, where a commodity is defined as origin, destination, and volume. So the triplet is attached to the definition of commodity. So if you start thinking about that, okay, I'm adding these two additional links, and it is the minimum cost. So it's the shortest path problem. The shortest path for one IJ pair may not necessarily be on the shortest path for the other IJ pair. Right, so it may, I think it because of, I guess I, you may be thinking about a specific IG, IG pair, which is why it may seem like that, but it may not be the case all the time. Because depending on the uh, this, this origin destinations and the route, basically a, a specific link may not always be on the shortest path for all the possible IG pairs. Right, it has to be the shortest path, right, shortest path, but that may have some links which may be shortest for one, but it may not be shorter for the other one, but, but all of them may be using an art only. Okay? So that's the, I don't know, that's probably the, the best way I can try to explain this. So I think the confusion you have is that, why do I have to solve the lower level problem or what, what So you, you 
have said that uh, this one side provide this sort of augmented network to the railroad company, they are solving that as a main possible problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Each of the ten ordinary. Each of the okay. ten you found ordinary links. Right. So when you have like for one link, you have like three ordinary links. Okay. Why would anyone go for a link which has like higher length? When we actually have has a commodity which goes for this link. And this is penalized because of the cost benefit, like a snake link. So he has like two three ordinary for that link, right? That's right. So why would we cheat? Why would we have a confusion which one to choose of the ordinary links? Why would we have a because, because each link in right because because right okay, got, got your point so you're looking at this from the perspective of the railroad company who wants to minimize cost but but you may choose one of the three alternative links which will result in the lowest cost but the regulator has information about what that cost translates into risk and the regulator is the one who's making the higher level decision about investment which of those three links it should open that information is not really necessarily determining what these guys want to do the railroad company. Which is where, where this sort of interaction comes into play because the, the previous work that I was cited basically, basically citing the routing work. So all we have done is a by objective model that we do. So we solve it from the cost perspective, risk perspective, and then we just build a parental front, which a number of possible solutions. That is not really sort of doing the work here because here we are saying that that is possible, you can always do that. But as a regulator, I want to know that if I'm, I have all these additional budget that I'm willing to spend, how should I spend it? And the railroad company hopefully is going to follow whatever you are, whatever you suggest. Because without that, it's not interesting, it's a single shot problem, right? So the interaction is not really coming into it. Because if I have information about everything, I can solve this as a, this a single level in my team. Right. With, with bio objective situation. Yeah. So one of the things you just mentioned about bio objective. So what I see here is that there could be a possible formulation of a bio objective bi level problem over here. Because the regulator as such might not only be concerned about uh, the risk, but also the regulator might be concerned about how much increase in cost it is providing Absolutely. to the users. Yeah. So there could be two objectives for the regulator and at the same time he knows that the lower level is going to solve the cost minimization problem, right. isn't it? So there could be a bi-level framework where, the, where at the upper level you do have multiple objectives and you are solving a lower level problem corresponding to your parameters. It's, it's absolutely true and I think interestingly that you brought this up. So one of the other things that we have done which is, which is within a disruption context, so it's a random disruption in the network where we have a sort of a bi-level and a bi, so bi-objective, bi-level formulation, which is looking at the railroad setting kind of thing, how we can sort of transfer risk from one network to the other. So, so we have looked at that, but not so much, I think, given this particular setting. However, it will be useful, and yeah. I think, to look at sort of reformulating the upper level to right. see if There's that's quite, quite a few other them. things. So you have the cost for, you have the budget for the regulator, you have uh, the cost structure for the lower level guy, mm -hmm. and then the third thing that you are interested in is the risk. So That's these right. are our three, uh, uh, three objectives or three criteria that you would like to look at the upper level. Yeah. yeah. So what if the budget itself is variable? What if? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So I think there are a number of sort of uh, sort of possible sort of relaxation. I guess relaxation may not be the word, but we can relax the assumptions and. Not, not really treat them as a parameter and more, more like a not of anything the decision we are making. Yeah. Based on our understanding of how this is working, 
so it seems that uh, after, so I was able to sort of provide many options as alternative routes, and I think it was okay until four. Beyond that, it was sort of stable, and then after seven, it started deteriorating. So, so the only possible explanation that we have been able to sort of come up with is that what is happening is that I'm providing these additional links and I'm coming so basically it is basically incremental analysis, right? So whatever has happened, I'm comparing that to the basically previous stage, whatever has happened. So one of the things which possibly has happened in this case is that I have opened one or did this alternate link and that alternate link is uh, Basically, yes, at a location, location or basically one of the one of the rail lanes, uh, which may not be presenting us with that much of a less risky route or option for the overall flow of traffic. That may be okay for a localized flow of traffic, one or two IJ pair, but not the overall scheme of things. Which is the only thing that we have been able to come up with. So that is a very fair point. I don't really have a better explanation for that because our numbers, the, the decoded basic solution is just telling us that at the moment. Um, and it sort of just deteriorates from 7 to 10, so it starts dropping down quite a bit. So actually there is a gain in risk if you think about this, which is uh, sort of ridiculous. Yeah, the flattening part is still understandable, like yeah. as you keep on adding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but it has happened in some other things we had done. So, so I, have, I was involved in a study with Transport Canada about emergency, designing emergency response network. And out there also we had to make a decision about uh, where should we locate these emergency response facilities. And they had a budget for seven. But, but then based on the analysis, they could see that, that you don't really need to sort of open more than two facilities. Because opening any more was what is all it was doing, it wasn't really improving the coverage, it was just stockpiling more equipment at these locations. So it wasn't really helping, and so it can happen. So it, I don't want to say it is specific to the data set, uh, but it's possible that it's just so. I think we were thinking about a localized setting, but in a whole scheme of things, it's not helping, which is good because that way we were able to cut it off at four. Uh, and say that this does not make sense to invest. However, as has been mentioned by Professor Sinai, uh, I think the idea is that uh, ideally you want to do sort of, or you do want to basically just enumerate all the possible, not to enumerate, but you want to sort of investigate all the possible values. So if you tell me you have a budget of four units, then it's like 10 choose four, which is so many combinations that you want to evaluate. I don't think you want to do that. Uh, you can think about 100, I can top 100 leads. Uh, so any number of things that you can do, depending on how strong the solution part is, but as you can see, we are really sort of stuck with the solution.